so it's a pleasure to reconvene here for the second day of the Electoral Integrity Workshop, which is being one of the key uh, events to close uh, the semester, at least in Europe. Um, and here today we have one a very interesting session. I wouldn't dare to say it's the most interesting, but one of the most interesting se sessions. Uh, with the topic that it's becoming more and more prominent. Particular insights regulating technology in elections. So we've been having this, we had this um, in Brazil, which was one of the main ones in the US and in many cases around the world. And it's a pleasure to hear now from the practitioners from the community to see what's outside and what's going on. Um, we have four great presentations today. So the first one, it's building re resilience against election influence operations, how European countries can protect the electoral experience. And we have participants from IFAS, Daria Azariev North, Nicoleta Diossi, Tricia Sikora, I'm sorry if I'm misspelling your name, from the German Marshall Fund and the Alliance for Securing Democracy. The second presentation is Opportunities and Limits for Digital Provenance to Save Online Truth by Ingo Bowles from the Carter Center. The third one, the AI Election Security Handbook, Rachel Dean Wilson from the German Marshall Fund Alliance for Securing Democracy and Lisa Gorman from the German Marshall Fund GMF, GMF Tech. Um, and finally, the last presentation, the Use of Artificial Intelligence Act and its impact on electoral processes, a human rights-based approach by Armin Rabic from Election Watch EU and Sofia Calabrese from the European Partnership for Democracy. So without, uh, and unfortunately, we don't have the, the last uh, presentation. So without further delays, um, I'm going to give the floor to the first presenters. So building resilience against election influence operation, how European countries can protect the electoral experience. So Daria, Krisha, uh, and you have the floor now. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, good morning, good afternoon to everybody. It's really a pleasure to be here and also see so many familiar faces. Um, unfortunately, my computer video feed is not working, so you'll just have to listen to my voice. Um, but my colleagues and I will be discussing today how to build resilience to election influence operations. Uh, recognizing that there is no silver bullet, uh, we will be drawing from several case studies um, in Europe, uh, based on our recently published white paper uh, by IFAS and GMF's ASD. So uh, we've come to know uh, 2024 as the year of elections, um, but uh, we also know they are taking place amid an increasingly shifting geopolitical and technological landscape. I see we're still loading the PowerPoint, but um, among the trends we're seeing, I know we're familiar with many of them. To name just a few, uh, that is um, the decreasing trust in democratic processes we're seeing across the world. Um, of course, the increasing threat of foreign malign influence, particularly from Russia and China, and against the backdrop of that, the role of technology and AI increasingly exacerbating these threats um, often blurring the line in our ability to distinguish real from fake. Um, also coupled by uh, the shifting role of tech companies and lack of regulations in this space. The European Parliament elections last month uh, were one of the biggest contests this year. Um, there was a very high level of foreign interference anticipated uh, and sustained, as we saw in many cases. A few points to note from what we saw in the lead up and the results. Uh, we saw the EU Crisis Response Corps activated, uh, which showed us that there have been some lessons learned from the pandemic uh, in terms of the importance of crisis response and crisis preparation. Uh, we saw the Voice of Europe scandal where MEPs were paid to speak for the Kremlin. Um, and then there was an overwhelming amount of Russian propaganda, disinformation narratives, uh, with an overarching goal of decreasing support for Ukraine, um, targeting polarization within societies as often times um, is the goal, and um, also seeing these narratives further amplified by local actors as well as right-wing parties. We also saw instances of right-wing parties using AI for their campaigns ahead of the elections, 
uh, as in the case of Italy and France. So um, as we talk about all these threats, I think many of us are aware there is no established framework or one size fits all uh, for countries to confront this threat. Um, so we really believed that it's important to highlight how countries can learn from each other and work together across se sectors to continue to evolve their strategies in parallel to the evolving technology and threats that we're seeing. This uh, inspired us for the five case studies that served as the basis for our white paper, um, highlighting best practices from five countries in Europe. Um, and these are, of course, just a few ways that European countries and others uh, facing these similar threats can adapt these strategies to proactively increase their preparedness and resilience uh, in the face of information related threats ahead of future elections. I would like to note that we wrote this before the European parliamentary elections um, as some best practices that could help protect the process. Uh, but this, of course, will also apply to rem remaining elections this year and beyond. Um, so considering that this presentation is taking place afterwards, uh, we will also talk a bit about more uh, what we saw in each of these countries in relation to the elections um, as it pertains. Uh, and here you'll see the case studies that we are highlighting are France, Sweden, Estonia, Bosnia and Herzegovina, and Ukraine, uh, each of them with their own um, kind of key lesson learned that we would like to extract um, for consideration. So as we look ahead, um, malign actors are increasingly coordinating and leveraging technology um, along with autocrats and um, exploiting crises. And so we believe it will be critical for countries to have a holistic approach and also uh, similarly coordinate together through um, a proactive collaborative means, uh, wielding technology and social media as a tool for protecting democracy. So this brings us to our first case study. Uh, we looked at France through the lens of the 2022 French presidential election. Um, during France's 2017 presidential election, as a bit of a backdrop, uh, frontrunner Emmanuel Macron uh, became the target of a coordinated foreign election interference campaign. Uh, this included viral fake news reporting, as well as a hack and leak operation to undermine his candidacy. Although this campaign didn't significantly impact the outcome of the election, uh, France learned from this experience and took significant steps to bolster their resilience uh, going forward. And so in preparation for its next cycle in 2022, uh, France developed a unit called the Guinum, whose mission is to detect, monitor, and counter foreign influence operations intended to undermine the country's stability. So throughout the 2022 campaign cycle, uh, Viginum then partnered with a fact-checking initiative of Agents France Press and Google uh, to characterize fact content as false or misleading, uh, as well as establish direct lines of communication with social media platforms. And um, during the election cycle, the unit identified 60 inauthentic occurrences across digital platforms, five of which met the definition of foreign interference and also gained traction amongst right-wing accounts. Before uh, we move on to our next case study, I do want to acknowledge that France um, experienced a significant uh, amount of disinformation in the lead up to the EU parliament election, uh, which also arguably played a role in Macron's motivation for calling the snap election that took place this weekend. The campaigns are also going into overdrive ahead of um, the Olympics and, um, as we saw, ahead of France's elections. Um, and although it is too early to draw conclusions, uh, we do see that France set up a good foundation to counter this disinformation going forward. And a main lesson here for other countries is that establishing such government units to monitor influence activities can be an invaluable tool for protecting elections. However, it's also critical that governments ensure that citizens' rights remain protected. Um, in the case of France, uh, before launching the unit, the government created safeguards to protect privacy rights 
and freedom of speech, uh, including regulations on how the unit collects and uses social media, as well as a committee to supervise the unit's work. And then finally, um, it's also worth noting that the Guinam's collaboration with social media platforms is one of many examples of cross-sectoral coordination worth highlighting as part of these efforts. Uh, Krisha, over to you. Thank you so much. And also, I just want to apologize for some reason when I started sharing or like starting the slideshow, it just stopped sharing the screen. So I apologize for there being a uh, miscommunication on not being able to see the screen at the beginning. Um, thank you, Daria. Um, like, for, uh, like France, Sweden is a global leader in developing best practices to counter election influence operations. And Sweden really started to focus in on this in 2018 after witnessing Russia's interference in the US 2016 presidential election, as well as other elections like France. Um, and uh, rather than just trying to attempt the halt of the spread of disinformation, Sweden decided to adopt a whole of society framework to build the resilience of its institutions and society's overall ability to, to withstand influence activities. Um, in 2018, Sweden started this by training and providing educational tools on foreign influence threats to its 14,000 civil servants and election officials. And this was highly successful. Uh, so in 2022, in preparation for the election, Sweden decided to double down on this whole of society framework and approach um, and launched the Swedish Psychological Defense Agency. Uh, similar to France's uh, Viganum, uh, the Psychological Defense Agency leads Sweden's monitoring of foreign influence activities, um, but it also has a second equally important role, and that is to direct uh, education initiatives intended to strengthen society's um, resilience to information manipulation. Uh, ahead of the 2022 general election, Sweden faced increased risk by risk of potential foreign interference and influence activities by Russia because of its bid to join NATO. Uh, therefore, to help counter these potential harmful narratives from Russia, the Psychological Defense Agency launched the Don't Be Fooled campaign, uh, which circulated educational videos, one pagers, and even um, provided free online courses to teach citizens how to better navigate the online information space uh, as well as just to raise their awareness of foreign influence activities and threats. Um, additionally, they published a guidebook to help journalists uh, learn how to better identify and respond to false information and briefed political parties about different influence uh, threats that they were seeing. Um, while Sweden didn't encounter the degree of foreign influence it had anticipated uh, leading up to the election, largely due to the war in Ukraine and Russia's uh, focus on other things. Uh, these proactive steps have contributed to the country's um, high voter turnout, which is usually around 80%, as well as society's overall satisfaction with uh, democratic institutions. Um, and this best practice is very transferable to other countries. Um, um, Estonia is also a very interesting case study because one, it has a high population of Russian speaking Russian speakers, many of which who obtain their news from Russian controlled media. And two, Estonia uses an internet voting system, uh, which is generally a voting system that has drawn skepticism for safety concern concerns. Uh, so these two factors make Estonia an easy target for malign actors from Russia seeking to undermine uh, faith in Estonian elections. Understanding these two challenges, Estonia decided to engage with its Russian-speaking minority and offer them a fact-based alternatives to Russian media. Uh, this started in 2015 when Estonia's public broadcaster launched a Russian language television channel, ETV+. Plus. Um, but then Estonia really doubled down on these efforts after the start of the war in Ukraine and before the 2023 parliamentary election. Um, they did so by providing grant money to um, 
private media to improve their Russian language media coverage. Um, and the Ministry of Culture distributed over 1 million euros worth of grants. Um, and with its allocation of uh, funding, Post Times, one of Estonia's most prominent newspapers, started to publish a, a print edition in Russian, as well as hired 25 um, new Russian speaking journalists and other media organizations uh, reported similar staff hires and similar projects um, with their funding. Uh, the strategy is really paying off in Estonia. Uh, despite widespread disinformation and the lead up to the election about the war in Ukraine, Russian speakers' trust in Estonian media has increased um, with the share of non-ethnic Estonians who consider um, Russian media to be an important source of news that has dropped from 30% to 10%. And just in general, the Estonian case study highlights the importance of trying to build a more inclusive society, especially um, within the information environment, uh, since marginalized groups are usually at greater risk of being targeted by influence campaigns um, with the purpose of trying to fuel societal discontent. Uh, off to you, uh, Nikki. Thank you, Krisha. Uh, and I will be talking about the last uh, two case studies, one from Bosnia and Herzegovina and the second one from Ukraine. So Bosnia and Herzegovina, which is a country with a complex uh, political landscape as well as history, faced significant challenges during the 2022 general election. The landscape was marked by ethnic tension, external geopolitical interests, divisive rhetoric, from politicians and a failure to agree on electoral reforms, which made the country very valuable, vulnerable to disinformation campaigns and malign influence from both domestic and foreign actors like Russia and China. The Central Election Commission described this period as the quote unquote, mo the most turbulent so far with the integrity of the election and the CEC itself under an attack. To counter these threats, the CEC decided to be proactive and build their capacity by implementing the crisis communication and combating disinformation playbook developed by IFES in partnership with the Brunswick Group. This playbook provided best practices for crisis communications, such as establishing a rapid response team, using early warning tools and engaging stakeholders through education and outreach. Ahead of the elections, the CEC also conducted a vulnerability assessment to identify high-risk false narratives using risk metrics, and after that, created a scenario plans to address them. For example, they prepared responses to possible accusations that they delayed delivery of election materials due to road closures, countering these false claims with accurate information and third-party uh, validations. The CC's efforts paid off as they effectively responded to multiple false narratives before and during uh, elections, and their actions were also recognized by the international organizations uh, such as OECE, noting that the CC administered the elections efficiently, transparently, and within the legal uh, deadlines, earning the confidence of the most stakeholders. So the key lessons of other EMBs uh, for other EMBs from Bosnia and Herzegovina case study include preparing ahead of elections, identifying target audiences, conducting self-assessment to identify uh, vulnerabilities, developing communication plans and build trust and maintaining consistent communication throughout the whole electoral cycle. And now let's look at the Ukrainian case study. Since the 2013 revolution of uh, dignity and Russia illegal annexation of Crimea in 2014, Ukraine has been engaged in both a kinetic conflict as well as information war. Ukraine's decade long battle against Kremlin uh, interference provides crucial insights into defending the electoral information environment. A key component of Ukrainian success uh, is a robust cross-sectoral coordination involving stakeholders from civil society, government, media, academia, and the private sector, while also harvesting emerging technology, technologies such as AI and machine learning. Uh, leading up to 2020 local elections, Ukraine faced a surge in Russian disinformation aimed at destabilizing the country. Uh, the Kremlin tactics included spreading fear about COVID-19 pandemic and undermining the Ukrainian state legitimacy, 
However, Ukraine, Ukrainians' preparedness and cooperation across uh, sectors effectively countered these narratives. And here on the second slide, uh, you will see stakeholders from various sectors. Worth mentioning is Detector Media and Stop Fake, which played a pivotal role in debunking full claims, enhancing media literacy before and during the local elections in 2020, and they are still debunking false narratives still today. Another great initiative from the civil society sector is a help SMI e-platform, which connects journalists with experts across various fields, promoting freedom of speech and countering malign narratives. This platform has exposed corruption and debunked false narratives, contributing to the integrity of Ukrainians' electoral process. From the government sector, uh, we mentioned the Center, Center for Countering Disinformation that debunks manipulative narratives and cooperates with civil society, such as Stop Fake, for example. And then the Center for Strategic Communication that also focuses um, on joint efforts with civil society to combat disinformation. Their debunking page, which is called Spravdi, has been instrumental in providing verified information, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. You can also see the private sector representatives that are using the AI and emerging technologies to counter disinformation. They employ technology to detect and counter online harmful narratives swift, swiftly and cooperate mainly with the Ukrainian government. So this collaboration between government, private sector and civil society strengthens Ukrainians' defense against disinformation, even amidst the challenges posed by the 2022 invasion by Russia and should serve as a lessons learned for other countries that want to better defend themselves against disinformation and maintain democratic resilience. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. Um, we have a very interesting first panel where we got many interesting cases around the world. And now without further delays, I would pass the floor to Inga Boltz, who is going to speak more about opportunities and limits for digital provenance to save online tr truth. Ingo, you have the floor now. You're muted. <sighs> Ingo? Let me try now. <laughs> Does yeah, that work? It's... Yes. All right. Good stuff. Let's just get this out of the way. All right. So um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about uh, experiments uh, here that uh, uh, myself and the, uh, my colleagues at the Digital Threats Initiative at the Carter Center have done with uh, digital provenance, um, which, is, um, which is a way to uh, prove uh, authenticity uh, and the, the origins of, of digital online media. And I'm actually, as we speak, I'm in Venezuela uh, on election observation mission, and we're going to have we're already started to use this technology to, to add a, a stamp of authenticity uh, to the uh, pictures and videos that we take uh, in the field. So why, why is that needed? Like today, uh, we still have the paradigm that uh, audiovisual media uh, records establish truth, right? So if you take a photo, a video, an audio recording of something, this is a record of reality. Uh, we use them to like establish ground truth for situations when we're not personally present. I mean, you know, if, every, if, if we've been there, we know it has happened, but we, if we haven't, then somebody providing us with this uh, is like, okay, it's been recorded, it has happened. So we can agree on something like that. Um, you know, Photoshop has been around. There's always been manipulated images, but um, it's it's like a learning curve. It's not trivial to do. Uh, so by and large, that paradigm still holds today. Um, now, I'm not going to bore you with too many details that everybody has heard the narrative. Generative AI, will it kill trust in the media? Uh, on the one hand, we have seen all the new AI tools who uh, make it easier and much cheaper to create fake records of, of reality, of events that actually never happened, the famous deep fakes. Um, and if we, as we get inundated with these, there'll just be a lot more lies uh, circulating. And in a one-two punch, uh, we also have something called the liar's dividend, which is just because there's so much hype about these new AI tools, 
uh, circulating in the media, and there's a perception that like really everything, anything can be made with AI. This allows bad actors to uh, dismiss and discredit authentic records of their misbehavior. They're just saying that this never happened. This is AI. Like I didn't do this. This is my political enemies operating. So with these two, like you know, how do we agree what has actually happened in reality? And what happens to things like evidence presented in court cases, right? I mean, uh, it, that used to be uh, something that has a lot of weight. Is that going to go away? Like, how will we supplement uh, uh, statements of witnesses in court cases if we don't have trust in these anymore? And we're seeing both of these already happening. I mean, there's uh, been ample coverage of uh, of use of deep fakes in election campaigns. Uh, it's been all over the place. Uh, and likewise, the uh, the uh, liars dividend defense that is happening. So uh, this is not just theory. This is actually happening in the real world. There have been a couple of solutions proposed to uh, mitigate that. Um, one has been watermarks. So if you say, well, um, any media uh, is embedded with a watermark that will uh, identified as AI generated, or maybe identified even as, as real, but mostly the focus has been on watermarks uh, for AI media. Um, now, it's a good idea, but there are a couple of problems with that. Uh, one is that uh, visible watermarks, they're very trivial to remove. Like if you've uh, made images with a uh, ChatGPT, with DALI, for example, you see there's like like a color, three little colored squares in the in the, in the right bottom corner. Um, that the tool puts in there. Uh, but if you are uh, bent on creating misinformation with these tools, the visible watermarks, visible watermarks <laughs> are trivial to remove. It's very easy. Um, you just like cut them off or crop the image or what have you. There are invisible more invisible watermarks, um, steno steganography, something like uh, a Google Scent ID, uh, which are hidden patterns in images that you don't see at first sight, which is both good because they're not as easy to uh, just crop or, or you know remove, but you can also not see them unless you have a tool that reads them and you know they're there. Um, and once you know they're there and what tool you read them with, again, there are ways to take them out again. So they're better than the visible ones. They're not as easy to remove, uh, but they're also not as easy to discover in the first place. Uh, and they can be removed as well by bad actors. And third, um, there are open source AI tools out there. Uh, you know, uh, Stable Diffusion, for one famous example, uh, that don't embed watermarks in the first place. I mean, there's a whole community of, uh, of open source AI developers who dislike what they call censorship, and they will just put out tools there that are very capable that do not embed uh, watermarks at all. So while maybe with regulation, uh, you can oblige big commercial AI tool providers to put these watermarks in, and there is pressure to do that, and that is good, but there's always going to be open source tools that don't put them in, so bad actors can always uh, fall back on those tools if they want to generate uh, AI images and videos without watermarks. Then you have detection. So the famous AI scanner, you know, you just uh, upload um, an image that you're wondering about, whether it's real or, or AI generated to, to some sort of scanner, and the scanner gives you magically uh, a percentage of certainty. Okay, you know, this is 60% uh, likely to be AI. Um, now this it looks very nice. There are a lot of these tools out there. Some of them are, most of them are commercial. Some of them are open source. Some of them just use one detector method. Some pride themselves on using many detector methods. Unfortunately, there is a lot of snake oil out there because many of these don't publish exactly what they do. The, the approach is usually a combination, uh, um, statistical search for statistical patterns that uh, supposedly identify images if they are made by models, by AI. Um, that is by no means like reliable, like to any degree of certainty. That's why you will usually not get like, this is 100% 100 certain this came out of a, a model. Um, you always get percentages. So how useful is that? If I'm like 70% sure this is AI, is that good enough? 
Um, also, uh, most images are post-produced, uh, even images taken in the real world, and some of them go through um, AI-assisted editing methods these days. So what's a legitimate modification of what's illegitimate what where does the uh the, the, the fake start and what is just normal post uh, production editing right and in the end um like pictures and videos made with ai are just a bunch of pixels showing you something so um they will eventually be so good that they cannot be detected i mean that's where we're going and with text you've already seen it uh there were a couple of uh uh, AI text generators, uh, text um, detectors out there that were supposed to show you if the text came out of ChatGPT or not, and all of them have been deprecated because they could not pick up on enough uh, statistic irregularities to be anywhere near sure where this text came from, a lot of false positives, so they basically stopped being using. And that is happening and will increasingly happen with these detection solutions as well. So. Uh, proposed solution three, digital provenance, turns that whole paradigm around. It says, you know, let's not try to detect if media is fake or has been made by, by uh, AI tools. Instead, we prove that media is real. Say, so, okay, this is came from a real camera that I pointed at a, pace, a point in space, uh, and I use cryptographically signed metadata as a way to prove that. And you've heard about metadata, like something you right click on an image, you see all these, you know, GPS, uh, where it's been taken, maybe the name of the author, what camera it was, or what phone it was, etc. It's all images that uh, it's all uh, data that is already uh, embedded into uh, into most uh, images. Um, the problem is it's very easy to edit. You can just go in and change it in any photo you take, any photo you find on the internet. You can just modify that to say whatever it wants, so you know, whatever you want. So it's not very reliable. There are ways to make that more reliable. Uh, they are not new. They're not coming from the AI age. Um, uh, there's uh, one strand of this technology that comes from uh, protecting uh, artistic intellectual property. Um, Adobe and uh, those big corporations that have been pushing that for a couple of years. Uh, and it also another strand that comes from documenting of human rights violations. So uh, witness.org has been working with, with that a lot. But they have been a product out for, for a couple of years. Uh, that helps document, for example, I don't know, like police violence in in uh, in in slums in in uh, Brazil, uh, so that a citizen activists can take um, audiovisual evidence of that and prove that they've actually taken that and hasn't been modified, etc. Uh, the the uh, term you've probably heard about most at the moment is an emerging industry standard. It's called C2PA. Uh, Coalition for Content, Provenance, and Authenticity, which is corporate-led. Um, it is uh, for, led by Adobe principally, but most uh, media and AI companies have kind of like gathered around it and are starting to support it. So that's the current standard that you'll, you'll see. So um, the way this works is basically you take a picture, uh, could be with a camera, could be with a smartphone app. Um, the um, metadata are taken as uh, with most normal pictures, but then they are digitally signed uh, with a digital signature that identifies uh, the person or organization that has taken the picture um, so that you can trust its origins. You don't see these, like it looks like just any other photos, but a photo or video, but if you upload that to a detection website, for example, content credentials, the C2PA one, but there are a couple of other ones out there, you just upload the image, uh, it reads the information and says, yes, this is a C2PA um, compliant uh, digital, what they call a digital manifest. And it shows you information uh, about that photo, where it was taken, when it was taken, who it was taken by, whether your camera details, et cetera, et cetera. So you have a bit more information that you can, at least in theory, trust about this. Now, high check. C2PA sells this as nutrition labels for media. You can just use these, like consumers can use these to distinguish between what's real and what's fake. Uh, this is the solution. Now, unfortunately, metadata can still be faked, even with C2PA. And uh, the, uh, the part that's really robust about it is the digital uh, cryptographic signature. What does that mean? Um, if I have my my signature key, my personal key, and I sign an image with that, you can be pretty sure that it was me 
who last edited this photo. I took it or edited it last. Um, and if you trust me, then uh, you can trust what's in the photo, in the image, what, what I say it is. However, since these signatures can be added to any image which contains any, uh, any metadata, it doesn't tell you anything about the content is real or not. I can you know, make a picture with AI, um, put lots of beautiful metadata in there where I, where I have taken this and uh, when I have taken this and who I am, which can be all fake. Then I sign it, I put it out there, the scanner side will say, hey, yeah, that's uh, you know, C2PA compliant. There you go, truth, and it's full of lies. The only thing you'll know is that it came from me, right? Um, why is that important? There was um, a, a BBC a C C2PA fiasco when they started using this, it was really, really interesting. Um, so they have a pilot project of using C2PA, and so they had a video, I think it was of Hawaii, uh, and they slapped all these uh, CQPA certifi certificates on them. On the website, you know, when you saw the video, it had all this beautiful information uh, where you could, uh, you know, open up a little sidebar and it showed you all the information. It was embedded in the video. Uh, and, it, you know, there you go, online truth saved. Now, um, there's a, a forensic Swedish forensic photo analyst who dug a little bit into that. He's a very interesting blog. And if you later look at the uh, slide, I've provided the uh, URLs to his analysis of that. It's a very interesting read if you want to dive in. Uh, what they did, what the BBC did, is they just took two random videos of social media. I think one was from Twitter, the other one was from TikTok. They spliced them together in their own editing room. They put some nice little animations over it and they made it pretty for the website. And then they signed it with their BBC uh, digital signature and put it out. Now, one of these uh, images had like a little weird sounding soundtrack. There's like people running away and there's like gunshots in the back. And it's like, whoa, okay, drama, great. And somebody like, like this uh, Swedish guy, he said, well, this sounds weird. This sounds too perfect. So he actually found the original video on TikTok, analyzed it and found it had been uh, altered. Somebody had taken out the original soundtrack and spliced in a loop of like more dramatic sounding gunfire to make it sound like more exciting. So what the BBC did is took a fake, if you want, and slapped their signature on it and presented it as online truth. So it is still a case of trash in, trash out. That is something to be very much aware of. Um, there are ways of within the, the CTP specifications to actually um, you know, uh, record the origin of source files, where you have them from. You can record editing steps of what you did to them. It's called ingredients. All of this can be in a manifest, but more often than not, it's not there because it's a lot of effort to do that. And sometimes you simply don't know. And even then, if the person signing it did stuff with it that was not correct, it's not necessarily that this hit the, the, uh, the manifest will tell you. Another few um, drawbacks. There are very few capture Ingo, tools, right? Sorry, yes. we just hit 15 minutes. So just letting you know, we have a few minutes more, but. Okay, yeah, I'm almost done, four slides. There's very few apps. There's three proof mode, true pick lens, click app that we've been using, and there's only one camera that can embed this. Um, and it costs ten thousand uh, dollars. I'm using them in the in the mission right now. Uh, most of the apps are slow because the cryptography takes a while to actually sign the images. Uh, they don't offer to actually use your own signature, so I cannot sign stuff at the moment with the Carter Center signature because the tools don't let me do that. They're just like random generic signatures, and saving the media without destroying the manifest is very difficult. So. Um, if I manage to build them with the signatures, then I have the problem that the moment I upload them to social media, you know, to Twitter, uh, uh, Facebook, what have you, they actually strip the information again to save storage space. So they get stripped out again. If I save them to my iPhone, they get deleted in the photo gallery. WhatsApp, I send them, they get re-encoded. I use the inf lose the information. So there's a lot of effort to generate these but um, it's very easy to break them. So will digital provenance save online truth? No, not like it is right now. Uh, it can help you 
trust uh, where a piece of media came from. But what's in the media, you still have to take it with a lot of pinches of salt. Once uh, adding the provenance becomes trivial, so it's in all the phones, all the photo cameras, and uh, personal signatures become common, so everybody can sign things. Um, and social media platforms and messenger uh, platforms stop stripping them, then maybe um, this will be a solution. Last comment, um, something we have to look at is, do we really want to have a massive push for only trusting C2PA signed images? Because there's still going to be a lot of, the majority of media we'll see will just, um, will have not C2PA uh, signatures because there's not many tools around. So do we dis want to discard everything that is authentic, that is just uh, maybe authentic media just because they don't have credentials? So that's like Liars TV and 2.0. And also human rights activists sometimes need to stay anonymous. Uh, Providence helps identify who took something where and when. So uh, oppressive regimes may use uh, Providence information to identify activists, which is something you really have to keep a close eye on. Thank you. That's it. Thank you so much. I think we're nice on time, but it's yeah. so from now on, I'll be pointing out when people reach the 15 minutes, but then we have a few more minutes to go. Uh, thank you so much, Ingo. I think it was very interesting, very thought provoking. Uh, and we're going to proceed to the next presentation, the AI Election Security Handbook by Rachel Dean Wilson and Lisa Gorman from the Journal Marshall Fund. So, uh, Rachel and Lindsay, you have the floor. All right, sorry, it always takes a minute to get settled and your screen up there. Hi, everyone. Um, Ingo, fascinating, and it, it's it's such a good, it relates uh, so well to uh, our election, AI election security handbook um, from ASD at GMF. Um, so um, we, I'm one of the managing directors at ASD, and then Lindsay Gorman um, is one of my GMF colleagues um, who is a co-author of this report, um, who will be uh, joining us as well. Um, so this report, we wrote this, uh, I'm not an, a lead author, but my organization wrote it in last fall um, when um, this AI threat was coming about. And, you know, we ask a whole lot of election officials. We don't, you know, I don't really need to belabor that with anyone on this call. Um, but, you know, they need to be communications professionals. They need to be health experts with pandemics, um, legal analysts, cybersecurity experts, um, and come 2024 AI experts. And so there was a lot of chatter and churn around the AI threat and, um, you know, not a lot of concrete, how should we be thinking about this? And so this handbook is an attempt to uh, provide a framework for election officials. Here's how you should be thinking about it in your lane um, and uh, explore a few of the potential problems and then provide some recommendations for steps they can take um, to kind of bolster uh, their operations against this threat. Um, so I will, there we go, um, speak a little bit on the threat environment heading into 2024, um, leaving aside any domestic challenges um, on the campaign front. Um, trust in the US political system is alarmingly low. Um, trust in elections, uh, after kind of a sustained uh, effort to undermine that trust um, from, from one of the um, leading candidates, Donald Trump, um, is low. Um, election officials and election workers continue to face harassment, high turnover, um, and stressful work environments. Uh, and then we have foreign and domestic actors looking to target um, the 2024 U.S. election campaign with cyber attacks and influence campaigns. Um, and we have all of these, these kind of threat pieces working together um, and AI will only supercharge these problems uh, that we, we faced a lot in 2020 and um, 2022. And now the ability uh, that we'll kind of walk through of AI to potentially supercharge uh, all of those uh, can only further complicate uh, these problems. Um, so this is, Oh, oops, there we go. 
Um, so for the framework for election officials, um, for this kind of amorphous AI threat, uh, we, we bucket it out into two buckets, cyber attacks, um, AI enabled cyber attacks and um, AI um, generated mis and disinformation. Um, so I'll start with the cyber attacks piece. Um, you know, AI, why do I keep doing that? Sorry, everybody. All right. Um, so AI is a supercharging agent on the cyber front. We still have most um, cyber attacks starting with uh, phishing attacks. And uh, AI has the ability to make phishing attacks so much more sophisticated and targeted. Um, it can help map election system vulnerabilities um, and, and really um, increase the volume and repetitiveness of cyber attacks uh, at little cost. Um, the phishing emails, and then just the perception of compromise could undermine trust. And so this is one of the, the pieces that's really important. Um, you don't even have to penetrate or compromise a system in order to impact trust of that system. If you have a situation where like, uh, you could, could, um, uh, tell everyone or generate some kind of information, disinformation that looks like um, a system was compromised. We have a report on that. And then um, just the perception, even if you buck it back, that it did um, can be damaging. So, you know, it's, it's a really fun uh, environment there. Um, and then on the AI made audio and video disinformation, again, supercharging a problem that, that election officials are incredibly familiar with, that they dealt with the last two election cycles, uh, at least. Um, but it's a new element because it makes it harder to debunk claims um, when, um, as Ingo just went through, um, it's harder to tell what's true and not. Uh, so a few examples that we've seen so far uh, this in this massive worldwide election year that we've had. Um, one was in Slovakia, um, where there was an AI generated audio of a leading candidate who said, um, who, who supposedly said in this fake AI generated content that, um, you know, talking about plans to rig the election um, that that was later debunked, but released, uh, I think it was like 48 hours right before the election. Um, and then everyone should know about the fake Joe Biden robocalls in the future, telling the Democrats um, that they shouldn't vote at all in the, the primary. Um, that was debunked, and, and the guy who's, who was um, responsible for it is actually being prosecuted. And then um, we also had uh, AI-generated videos in, appear in the um, the mayor's race in Istanbul. And those are just a few. There are some some other fascinating things of, of um, you know, dead leaders being regenerated by AI to speak to um, to electorates um, and, and, and folks from jail being AI generated giving remarks. So um, there's a lot of interesting ways that this is playing out on the campaign trail um, and, and in the campaign. But I will make one distinction. So these are all interesting examples. I'll make an important distinction for election officials. Um, I, I would almost say there's there's the type of disinformation that impacts the campaign, and there's the type of disinformation that impacts the election administration. And for election officials, it's really important that we stay focused on um, election administration. Like the, the Joe Biden um, robocall does have a direct impact if, if people aren't showing up to vote. Um, so how could AI impact 2024? Trust, trust, trust is, is the biggest one. Kind of any way you slice it, um, you are looking at uh, the potential for a further erosion of trust in our system um, by people overhyping the threat of AI, underhyping the threat of AI, uh, perception ha hacking, um, or, or any situation that I'm about to describe. Um, so, uh, you know, that is something that we will continue to, to have to, to deal with across the election space. Um, so the fueling of election subver subversion narratives and attempts at interference. Um, again, the supercharging aspect here. Um, so in 2022, we were very concerned that there would be kind of um, 
election denialism as a, as a campaign strategy and that we would see a lot of candidates who did not concede after um, after losing the 2022 midterm races. Uh, that didn't really materialize. We did have a few folks, um, mostly in Arizona, who did not um, concede. Uh, but if that is a path that candidates choose to go down, it, AI could make it more complicated. Um, it could it could help um, bring evidence that sort evidence that is um, tough to sort through and kind of bolster their case and confuse. Um, the same thing with certification of election results um, and then the discrediting of voting machines. And all of those three just having um, additional um, fake video or audio supporting these false narratives can really complicate matters in a way they didn't in 2020 and 2022. Um, there's the potential uh, public records request is, is a, already um, a problem for some election officials and just the, the mass amounts of these requests that they're getting and the idea that um, AI could be used to, to rewrite, tailor uh, these requests um, and 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 submit them at even higher volume. Um, and then, of course, using AI generated content, false narratives, bolstering those and um, increase could increase harassment and threats against election officials and workers. Um, so I will leave the impact there, not to be too scary, um, but then uh, send it over to Lindsay for solutions. Thanks so much, Rachel. Um, that's a great overview of the threats. And I think as we move to the recommendations and solutions that we've been um, putting forward to election officials, it's important to keep in mind something Rachel said at the top, which is that we really wanted this handbook to be practical and usable in the time frame of relevance to 2024. Um, and so, you know, as you'll see throughout the recommendations, some of these things are, are, recommendations and ideas that probably should have been implemented and still should be implemented um, from before. Some of them are newer ideas that we've had to appropriately sort of tailor and measure and make sure um, that they could be potentially implementable um, you know, by very, very busy election offices in a relatively short period of time, but can potentially lead to longer solutions down the track. So we've bucketed our, our the, the handbook itself had about 10 or 12 recommendations um, which we bucketed into three categories. First, incorporating AI risks into training and election planning. Obviously, election officials and offices do an extensive amount of training and planning for elections. And in the past, they've incorporated things like cyber risk, like pandemic risk, like the many topics that election officials have had to uh, become experts on and hats they've had to don. Um, we're advocating for adding AI to that mix. Um, second, doubling down on cybersecurity. So this is a suite of recommendations, largely not new, um, but because AI is, create, is is allowing actors to create more realistic spear phishing campaigns, um, especially in other languages, um, as well as automate the vulnerability scanning and finding process. Um, the, this is sort of all the more reason to double down on cybersecurity. And then lastly, leveraging new technologies and potentially AI itself for responsible use within the election office. And so to the next slide, please. Incorporating AI risks into training and planning. So that's building in consultation processes for you know, forming things like election security working groups specifically tailored to AI, AI and election security working groups, much in the line vein of cybersecurity working groups. Um, incorporating AI specific training for personnel and in tabletop exercises. We've actually seen a number of tabletop exercises um, popping up throughout the country, which has been very productive on you know, what happens if an AI generated um, deep fake comes into the infosphere, how should election officials respond? How should they communicate to their constituencies um, on it? Some of this training should also include, you know, what are these AI risks as Rachel laid out? Um, right sizing the level of concern and then providing talking points and guidance for how election officials can actually talk about the threat about of, of AI, you know, prepare, don't panic, um, communicating what it is, what it isn't, you know, how, how worried should we be? Um, and reminding obviously voters that their elections are safe and secure. Um, 
And then lastly, creating public records reading re request rooms to address the possibility of voluminous records requests due to AI. So one of the threats is what that that AI can pose to election officials is just the automation of these these records requests that are already bogging down election officials, already taking so much of their time. So to sort of automate this process, create these reading rooms, get it done and all all in sort of one fell swoop on the record requests can help expedite the process. Um, on to the cybersecurity risks. Again, these are not new recommendations, but um, we really want to emphasize that AI is a is a kind of an opportunity to make sure that we're we're getting um, getting our cybersecurity uh, features down. So that's things like securing official election websites with a .gov domain. Um, with AI generated imagery, it's actually, and and um, the ability to automate the creation of websites, it's far easier to create a more realistic looking uh, domain and a realistic looking um, official election or campaign website. Um, you know, previously uh, these websites looked a little sketchy. Maybe the images weren't quite right. The text was off. Um, there was something wrong with the formatting. Now it's actually much easier to create something that looks very realistic, which is why it's all the more important to have that .gov domain prioritizing the basics of good cyber hygiene, um, MFA, strong passwords, uh, and then keeping the hard copies of voter registration cards in case of a breach or compromise. And then um, lastly, you know, how can we leverage new technologies? And I'd say this is the area where I think we maybe struggle the most with how to communicate these recommendations without sort of overburdening um, officials who might not be the earliest adopters of new technologies uh, and, and the ones with the resources to really make that happen. Um, so I think we, we have a very measured recommendation on consider piloting content authenticity technologies, which Ingo talked about, um, to, to build trust and, and transparency. Uh, so thinking of things like campaign offices starting to put out their own content with uh, the C2PA standard to start to build trust. Um, obviously not something that's easy to do overnight. Um, and then secondly, add generative AI guidance to election office security policies. So if election officials themselves are thinking about using AI to automate their workflows, um, as many professions are, um, making sure there's clear guidance on, on how to do that uh, to not create sort of undue, undue alarm or confusion um, coming from the office itself. Um, so with that, yeah, th those are sort of the high level recommendations and look, yeah, very much looking forward to the Q&A. Okay, thank you so much. It's wonderful. Thank you, thank you so much for keeping up with, uh, with the time. And then last but not the least, Armin Ravic and uh, Sofia Calabrese, the EU Artificial Intelligence Act and its impact on electoral process, a human rights based approach. So Armin, up to you. Yes, thank you. Armin, I think you're muted. Now you hear me? Yes. And you see my screen? No. Not yet. Not yet, okay. but we can hear you. Now we see your. We started to see your screen. Your screen. Okay. Now we see it. Okay. Just taking this moment to say that after this presentation, we'll have a uh, discussion, uh, our discussant, Gabor Poliak from the Edwards Laurent University, uh, commenting on the on the presentations, and then we'll have the Q&A. Uh, Gabor, Armin, uh, I think we lost Armin for a moment. Okay. So maybe Armin? Yes, I'm here again. It seems each time I try to share my screen, I'm uh, I'm uh, losing my connection. I don't mm. I, I let me try it once more. 
Okay, okay maybe can... try turning your video off. I don't know, sometimes it works, but I think we have someone from the tech here. Okay, okay. I tried I tried to share again. Yeah. Okay. Let's see what it works this time around. Let's see what happens. In any case, you can hear perfectly, which is the most important, mm -hmm. I'd say. So we can see your screen now. Okay, very good. So it works now? Yes. Okay, great. So it's just without video and um, yeah, thanks uh, Carla for the patience and uh, good day everyone. Uh, my name is Armin Ravich from Election Watch EU and together with Sofia Calabrese from European Partnership for Democracy, uh, we drafted this uh, pr practitioner's paper on AI Act of the European Union. Now today I'm only, um, it's, it's me uh, presenting, Sophia is already on vacation and um, I'm uh, basing uh, our, our, our paper is based on two um, events. One is the election assessment mission of the election watch EU, to which also Kala was, uh, was participating. Um, and uh, that was actually an exercise of election observers, election experts um, during the European Parliament elections. And we particularly looked also into the AI in elections, but also the implementation of the Digital Services Act, which was already applicable for these elections, while the AI Act only comes into force um, in, in August. Uh, our final report of this election assessment mission will come out um, late September, beginning of October. And uh, the other event was a workshop organized by the European Partnership for Democracy on identifying AI systems posing risk to election integrity under the AI Act. And that took place um, late May this year. Um, now, let me go back um, to 2019, where Election Watch EU also conducted an election assessment mission to the uh, European Parliament elections, and we came up with a final report with 16 recommendations, and two of them were social media regulation uh, recommendations. Yeah, and um, in this, um, we and, and back then there wasn't any uh, European regulation for the online space in place, and. We actually recommended to create a level playing field and transparency in the campaigns and productive privacy of European citizens through a clear regulations, coherent implementation and independent oversight by the European Union of the political campaigns in social media and online platforms. And that's interesting and I will show that on the next slide. And um, the second recommendation was to enhance the effective electoral campaign oversight and better detection and analysis of disinformation campaigns uh, of social media platforms and meaningful access to data to election monitors, academics, observers, uh, and keeping in mind the data protection rules of the European Union. Now, that's the interesting aspect now, and that's probably also the big difference to the Euro of the European Union to the United States. Yeah, because since 2019, the EU did a huge step forward in regulating the online campaign space in elections. And that's um, the Artificial Intelligence Act of this year, which comes to force uh, in August and then has a staggered uh, enforcement schedule in the next two to three years. Uh, then the Digital Services Act, as I said, already applicable for the European Parliament elections. This year, the Digital Markets Act, and then uh, also the European Media Freedom Act, which also comes only in, into force later this year, and the transparency and targeting of political advertising regulation, which builds on the self-regulatory code of practice against disinformation. Also, only parts of it came into force for this election of the European Parliament, and most of it will now come into force thereafter. And I also mention here the general data protection regulation um, of 2018, because it's very important, this respect and upholding human rights in elections. And um, many say that the AI Act might have a similar implication as the GDPR. Yeah, I just wanted uh, to emphasize that this is probably the biggest achievement uh, by the European Union that they came up with this uh, electoral legal framework uh, in the digital space ahead of the elections of the European Parliament. Now, if you look at the election assessment mission of 2024, we see that um, two member states already 
have national legislation in place for labeling AI generated content. Yeah, and uh, that's also what what um, Ingo was referring to. So, and with the AI Act, that will become a, a, a common practice that AI generated content uh, have to has to be labeled. Now, from our assessment, uh, Selection Watch EU, we have seen that seven member states have uh, seen AI generated content uh, and detected so in the online campaigning. And we also heard from IFS today that there's also uh, Italy and France uh, was the case that there was AI generated content used in the campaign. Mostly, and that's probably the big difference now to the US elections which are coming in November, um, in the European context, which mostly saw satirical uh, deep fake video and audio or advertising scams with VIPs ahead of the elections. Yeah, so it, there wasn't really any uh, very serious uh, AI um, generated uh, deep fake video or audio used. Um, it's mostly used by populist right wing parties or left wing activists. And for, you know, I bring two examples here. One is the deep fake video by German Chancellor Schwartz calling for an AFD ban that was done um, by left-wing activists. And then you have this example of uh, AI-generated fake identities to, to pretend broad support for the Irish People Party. Um, there is also an interesting study, which I would like to refer to, that's from uh, Democracy Reporting International, which looked into the accuracy of AI chatbots like ChatGPT, Copilot, Gemini, uh, since they are less reliable than search engines. Then uh, looking into the Artificial Intelligence Act, it's important to understand that this is a horizontal legislative instrument for all AI systems in the EU. So it also covers everything from agriculture to art to uh, fundamental rights, including elections. And it's important to understand and, and read <clears throat> the article one, which says, ensuring a high level of protection of health, safety, and fundamental rights enshrined in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union, including democracy, the rule of law, and environmental protection against the harmful effects of the AI systems in the Union. Now, this is all work in progress, and uh, the European Commission is now establishing a European AI office, so they have already recruited 200 staff as the European Commission AI office will be the one overseeing the implementation of the AI Act in all its uh, details. Then uh, on top of that, there will be a European AI board, which is comprising all the uh, 27 member states and their representatives from the various cybersecurity offices or AI offices. And it also includes the European Data Protection Supervisor. Yeah, that's an independent office which takes care that the GDPR is implemented accurately. They had already a first, basically, inofficial meeting on the 19th June of 2024 because they only come in force with the enforcement of the AI Act. And interesting for civil society, but also academics, is that there's an advisory forum which also includes the Fundamental Rights Agency in Vienna, but then also. Uh, the various security and standards agencies of the European Union, and on top of that, various civil society organizations. And the question is, okay, to which extent they will be represented and to which extent also small and medium enterprises and co international corporate um, companies will be represented in that. Now, what's, what's interesting for us in terms of elections is the systems of risk uh, classification which the AI Act undertakes. And here you look at the uh, different, you know, there are four categories and mostly important is the uh, first category, which is the prohibit or unacceptable risk category, where for example, the social scoring is included. Then you have the permitted um, high risk category and then the limited and permitted um, so-called transparency risk which includes also chat uh, bots and deep fakes. And the, the question is, okay, what is high risk and what's limited risk? And this line to take, that's currently the discussion within the commission and within the uh, European Union. And that's where guidelines by the European Commission will provide greater orientation in this respect. And then as the green 
um, level you have the min minimal or no risk category of AI um, in of the AI Act. Now, what what are the prohibited AI practices of the AI Act <clears throat> when it comes to elections? Yeah, and here first is is, is this subliminal techniques beyond the person's consciousness, and that's that's very interesting. Okay, what is that? Yeah. Uh, and, and we need to fill that with more uh, understanding and definition. Then the purposefully manipulative or deceptive techniques with the objective or the effect of materially distorting the behavior of a person or group and by impairing the ability to make an informed decision. Yeah? So we understand here it's, it's going very much into this free choice of the vote by a voter. Yeah? And here we will see to which extent the EU will take um, uh, reference of the United Nations Human Rights Committee, which also uh, uh, brought out um, a general comment, which says uh, there shouldn't be any uh, manipulative interference in the choice of the voter. Yeah, and that could be seen as a manipulative uh, interference which could uh, cause that person or that group significant harm, yeah? Uh, and the other aspect is that it, uh, an AI system might exploit vulnerabilities of natural person or group, whether it's from their age, their disability, or specific social or economic situation in distorting their behavior, and again, cause um, significant harm. Now, uh, the other, the second category which I mentioned is this high risk AI practices. Yeah, and here the AI systems are particularly mentioning election, elections in um, uh, this uh, respect. And the AI systems intended to be used for influencing the outcome of an election or referendum or the voting behavior of a natural person in the exercise of their vote in elections or referenda. Yeah, and my question here comes. Um, okay, is it sufficient if it in, impacts one person, 10 persons, 100 persons, 1,000 persons? How do we measure that? Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, questions which we asked ourselves in this workshop. Uh, is, is, is this category, including AI systems used to deliver political advertising, profiling voters, including micro-targeting or amplification techniques? Um, then AI systems used to process or count voting ballots. So these are the kind of assistant, assisting uh, techniques used by EMVs. And then uh, AI systems used to identify cybersecurity attacks, uh, or then also chatbots, which could be used for voter assistance, and AI chatbots to perform voter data analysis and predictive, predictive analytics. And finally, um, counter bias content and uh, electoral content moderation. Yeah, so we see that AI can be used also in the positive term, but it could also require um, uh, a risk assessment um, by the company or by the provider, like an EMB, which, which uses such AI uh, supported practices. Now, the questions which needs to be answered by the commission is, which AI systems are posing risks to the elections and should be prohibited under the AI Act. Um, then the second, uh, as I mentioned already, which AI systems are posing a risk to elections uh, and would be high risk under the AI Act and then could be possibly permitted under special circumstances. And then what are limited AI risks and are they posing any risks to the elections? And then fourth, or what are the main risks posed by AI systems intended to be used to influence elections? And what are the most effective mitigating measures um, in this respect? And we've heard already from the uh, um, uh, German Marshall Fund uh, possible uh, mitigating measures in this respect today. Now, I would like to conclude with recommendations to the commission. Yeah? And first, we would think it is possible and, 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 and necessary to consider a moratorium for the use of AI systems in electoral campaigning in order to better understand this, the 
societal and political impact of the AI used in electoral campaigns. Yeah, because we have seen that certain political forces, which are not necessarily fond of democracy, gain exponentially by the use of AI and social media techniques. Yeah? And in order to avoid that anti-democratic forces come into power and possibly change democratic rules, there, there should be a, a better understanding, okay, to which extent are they able to use it better than other democratic parties or it supports their cause better because it's, it's easier to address emotional uh, issues of concerns of voters. Yeah? A second uh, recommendation would be the draft provisions and guidelines on the fundamental rights impact and <clears throat> provide uh, risk assessments of the use of AI in electoral processes. That means third party, um, independent third party agents or organizations could provide this kind of external risk assessment or in terms of human rights. And then uh, another recommendation would be the definition of individual or societal harm in the election to understand better uh, whether uh, this is only one vote which could make a difference in election or it, it is uh, uh, the electorate per se and to see whether the result of an election is reflecting the will of the voters. Other um, recommendations include a clear definition of the significant harm concept to clarify the link between the AI provisions and the Digital Services Act and the, GD, the General um, Data Protection Regulation, and then whether AI systems could be prohibited, exposed, and examine um, AI applications like micro-targeting, app delivery techniques, and other uh, techniques for election-related impacts. For civil society, we think there is a need to provide examples of past incidents where AI has led to real harms in order to provide the commission with guidance on what to take care of and what to prevent, uh, obtain more evidence on how certain potentially prohibited AI systems could influence voting behaviors. Um, we think that civil society could and should feed into the debate uh, and, and with, with the risk assessments and the standards for high risk uh, AI systems related to elections. And then as a, as a final recommendation, also to develop and test good practice templates and examples of fundamental rights impact and risk assessments for the use of AI in elections to protect and uphold the democratic uh, process. I keep it with that and I'm looking forward to the Q&A session. Thanks very much.